Welcome once more to my nightmare world of fear and horror. Tonight, I extend to you all an invitation to the vaults. Water is inexorable. When tides turn, if not blocked off, the flood goes where it will. In the subterranean cesspits of our civilized world, rats in their millions run in fear before this flood, and if not stopped, they too go where they will. So it is in the dank vaults beneath the Palazzo Tortini in southern Italy. From the days of the Borgias and Medicis to the present, the tides flood in twice a day, and ahead of it, the rats seeking sanctuary in this, their underground hideaway. At the center of the vault, a high pillar disappears into the gloom above. At the base of the pillar, a shackle, and attached to that shackle, a short, strong chain. Time alone will reveal its purpose. In the gardens of the palace above, Madame Freitas, the widow of one of Italy's greatest authors, takes tea with her good friend and constant companion, Dr. Mazanares. <laughs> the prerogative of the modern woman would appear to be to amuse and bemuse in equal proportions. And as ever, madam, you succeed admirably in both. <laughs> oh, do enlarge upon the thought, good doctor. The idea that anything could bemuse an author of your infinite wisdom, I find distinctly hard to credit. I recall you saying some weeks back that a man had written to you asking if any of your husband's papers were free for publication. That is true. You told me at the time all 13 volumes of the as yet un published work were already promised to major publishing houses. Equally true. And now you tell me this unnamed gentleman is shortly to arrive and curtail our afternoon tea. Unfortunately, also true. The name of the gentleman in question is one Albano Pizar. And the reason you decided to see him, in spite of your first reservations? He is a very special case. A very special case indeed. It was he who, as a publisher's reader in Rome, saw the worth of the first short stories my dear departed husband wrote. Ah, the stories, if I remember correctly, would, which were difficult to place? Difficult? Oh, impossible. They'd already been turned down by every major publishing house in the country, including the one for whom this Albano Pizar worked at that time. So how did they come to be published? He, Pizar, had such belief in their worth. He left the firm and somehow managed to buy a small share in a minor but respected publishing house in Paris. He then convinced the house to publish the stories. So, he is a successful publisher? Not anymore. The publishing house with which he was connected finally overstretched itself and failed. He disappeared from the scene for some time. His letter was the first I had heard of him for many years. Hence my interest. So pray, madam, how does he now earn an honest crust? He says he is an author's agent. An agent? Did I hear you correctly? I am to have my tea curtailed by an agent. How could I ever set an honest crust? No agent has ever earned an honest crust. Starving. Not a bite to eat on the train for love, no money. If I'd had money, the poor traveller crushed together like rats. And I, who was meant for greater things, am constantly forced by circumstance to join them in their jowl-to-jowl -jowl misery, imitating that species of vermin I most abhor. I mustn't think about them. Not the rats. If the caretaker hasn't cleared them from that vile tenement I inhabit, I shall... I, I, I mustn't think about them. No. Think of Madame Freitas. She will surely reward me for my help in getting her husband's career underway. If it wasn't for me, Freitas would have lived and died a non-entity. Madame must realize she owes me much. She must. A beautiful car. That's how I should be traveling. A limousine with a chauffeur at the wheel. For the moment, no chance, but soon, with luck. The chauffeur's looking straight at me. This car is for me. Already the dream starts to come true. 
You had a good journey, I trust. Oh, delightful. I was tempted to have my chauffeur drive me, but the roads I know can be a little bumpy this far south. I do find, being honest, that first-class travel gives one ample time to contemplate the landscape in comfort. Uh, the journey over in a trice. Uh, the only tragedy is the lack of an acceptable restaurant cause uh, these days. The pastry is enough, or, or would you No, prefer... no, no, this is wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, you've changed a great deal over the years. I remember you quite clearly as a thin young man. And now what you see is a fat old one. <laughs> no, that was not in my mind. Your face has, if you will excuse me, hardened a little over the years. It has been a somewhat hard life, madam. Of course, my recent success makes life a little easier, but there were difficult days. Why didn't you contact my husband, then? Oh, I did, madam. I telephoned frequently, but my calls were never returned. In the end, I... Do you know why? Maybe sometimes there are areas of our lives that we do not wish to reopen. I presume that was the case with your husband, and naturally I respected that right. Hopefully, what little I have to offer may go some way to making up for any slight you may have felt. Oh, there is still some of his work unspoken for? As I explained in my letter, the books are already tied up with publishing houses. Indeed, but I was wondering about his correspondence. Is that also spoken yes, for? Yes, I'm afraid so. Oh. With the proviso that it is not to be published until after my own death. Really? May I ask why? There are certain sensitive areas that I would rather not have revealed during my lifetime, but it is a matter I would not care to discuss further. But of course. My apologies for introducing the subject. That is all right, monsieur. You weren't to know. So, while the bulk of his work is spoken for, I can only presume, as you were kind enough to suggest I journey from Paris and that you allow me to take up your valuable time like this, that there will be something to make my journey worthwhile. This leather folder contains all that I am free to let you have. It's locked. Ah, yes. The key. I should like to peruse the contents at my leisure, and I'm sure, as with all his work, it will prove a delight. And what would be your intention if you found the material was of use? I have in mind a slim volume, exquisitely bound, printed on the best possible paper, with introductory notes and addenda by myself. A very fine and expensive limited edition, in fact. I believe uh, there must be a market for such a collector's item. You may indeed be right. Uh, so perhaps I could... Take this folder with me and come back and discuss it with you tomorrow at uh, ten thirty. But of course, nothing, nothing whatsoever. This is a joke, an insult. I'll be revenged for this insult to my intelligence. But how? Correspondence, she mentioned, certain sensitive areas that must not be revealed during my lifetime. That's how she put it, not even to be discussed. But what? Scandal. Scandal concerning their marital relationship, which was known worldwide as the perfect marriage. Not possible. And yet, such a story, if true and confirmed by existing correspondence, would cement my fortune forever. Picture the library. Recapture it in my mind's eye. Shelf upon shelf all around me. File upon fat file, every colour under the sun. Wait. In the corner, farthest from the doorway, the top shelf. Three slim red files side by side. That's got to be it. In all that vast acreage, only those three files were thin enough to hold what I hoped to find. But how can I arrange to be left alone when I call back tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs>
And of course, we come to the world rights, madam. It is quite amazing how in some countries, when a particular volume catches the reading public's imagination, it can then take off in a totally unexpected fashion. I quite understand your need to inform me fully, and I admire your enthusiasm for the work in question, but we have been discussing the fine detail for over an hour and a half now. Excuse me. Yes, she said? Ah, tell him I shall be with him shortly. Would you excuse me a moment, monsieur, but a friend of mine has just called. Uh, but of course. I shan't be more than a few minutes. Oh, please don't hurry. I shall use the time to contemplate further on our contractual agreement to ensure I haven't missed anything. Oh, I doubt whether you have. We seem to have ranged over every possibility under the sun. Always as well to ensure the client knows what's in store. Yes, I'm sure you're right. I must be quick. Move the ladder over to the far side. No, that's not it. Oh, just bills, letters to lawyers. No, oh, this one. Damn. Only one last possible hope. You have literally saved my life. Madam? I have always thought that dying of boredom was simply a figure of speech. But I have this morning, Doctor, looked into the eyes of death in such a fashion. There is only one creature on the face of Earth who can succeed time and time in inflicting that dastardly method of execution. The literary agent must still be here. Correct. And he has been for hours, but no longer. I shall now use your arrival as an excuse to ask him to depart. <laughs> Come. Feel free, madam. To we writers, the departure of an agent is a gift to the whole of humanity. Now, a little to the left. Yes. Good. Now. Where can I hide them? Oh, but of course, in the leather folder she lent me. Oh. I did it. Now relax. Good. Good. Monsieur, bad news, I'm afraid. My friend has urgent business, and I must sadly bring our meeting to a close. Of course, for my part, I have good news for you. I thought the project through very carefully, and there are no more points to be discussed. So, with your permission... Uh, monsieur, you are forgetting my folder... No, no, I have it safe here under my arm, madam. Exactly. That is the folder I use to keep my current projects in. Perhaps you'd take the papers out and... Are you all right, monsieur? You've gone very pale. I'm uh, fine, madam. Uh, sometimes my heart gets a little out of sorts, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm fine. Oh, good. I'm pleased there's nothing serious. Uh, the folder? I... I, 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 I'm afraid I foolishly left its key at my hotel. Perhaps your chauffeur could bring it back with him when he drops me off. Yes, that would be fine. Good day, monsieur. A good day, madam. After cheating me out of the royalties on my last book, my agent came to my home as if nothing untoward had happened, <laughs> walked in and greeted me as if I was a long-lost friend. <laughs> and what did you say in the face of such barefaced insolence? Ah, at such times, actions speak louder than words. I simply threw him out of the window into the canal below. <laughs> Who on earth is... I'm sorry to bother you. I think you should come at once. Why? What is it, Giselle? Some of the files in the library have been... disturbed. Which? Which? The red ones. What exactly are you afraid has gone missing? A moment, Doctor. The last file will confirm or deny my worst fears. Madam, the seal is broken. Bring it down. Madam. Empty. Everything gone. Gone. You must tell me what has happened. Giselle? Madam? You may tell him. Soon the whole world will know. 
Excuse me, I must go. Madame, are you? Giselle. Yes, sir. What was in this file? Letters. A series of letters of the frankest kind between Monsieur and Freitas and a certain lady of the town. But that is impossible. His reputation, he was a man of absolute honour. Their marriage was renowned worldwide. It is inconceivable. It was many years ago, but I'm afraid it's true. And Madame kept them? As his archivist, she had no choice, even though it grieved her. They were part of his life, so had to be kept safe for posterity. But they were not to be published till after her death. I fear that now... But this will destroy her. Make her a laughing stock. It can only be, Monsieur Pisa. You must get them back. I will go to his hotel at once. Tell Madame, I will not come away empty-handed. I'm sorry. As I said before, she's not here. Now, would you all kindly leave and stop constantly ringing the doorbell? Come along, you go inside. Within days, the house was under siege with reporters from around the world. The doctor put his property in the Umbrian Hills at the disposal of Madame Freitas until the ensuing scandal should die away, and promised that when it came to finally balancing the books, as it surely would, there was nothing he wouldn't do at her request, even to relieving Pizar of his oh-so-worthless life. But in the cool of the hills, she used the passing months to plan a more subtle revenge, a Sicilian revenge. Death was too quick and too kindly for such a creature. And now she knew what his punishment must be, and yes, she would need the good doctor's willing help in putting her plan into operation. The correspondence was the publishing coup of the decade. The appearances that Pizarre made on television ensured that within weeks he was famous, within months he was rich. Finally, Madame decided the time was ripe, and the bait was proffered. Dear Monsieur Pizarre, the financial success you have achieved handling certain of my husband's papers indicates it would be more productive for the estate if you handled the sensitive work that still remains secretly within my remit. If you are interested, if I'm interested, I've been handed a fortune on a plate. Bait has been taken. Hook, line and sinker. Now all that remains is to slowly reel him in. And make just one little purchase. One sharp little purchase. You're sure you won't change your mind and take a drink, Monsieur Pizarre? It must have been a long and tiring journey. No, thank you. In your letter, you mentioned that you'd like me to handle other sensitive material in your possession. First, I wish to congratulate you on the success of the volume that you produced from the papers I gave you, and for letting me have the royalties so promptly. Yes, well, it is the job of the agent to be punctilious in such matters. Uh, last time I was here, I detailed at length what would be my commission levels, what you would have to pay. You did indeed what I would have to pay for your last visit. Yes, well, if I handle this uh, sensitive material for you, no one need ever know you release the material to me. Do you know the Koran, Monsieur Pizarre? I beg your pardon? The system of judgment laid down in the Koran. Well, I know it, of course. But I can't see what possible merit... It has always struck me as such a sweetly reasoned document. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth just so simplistically and satisfyingly fair. I really didn't come here for philosophical debate. We have been talking a long time now about this and that. Isn't it time we got down to the real purpose of this meeting? Yes, you're right. So, many thanks for visiting me, monsieur, but now, all too soon, it is time for you to depart. Pardon, madam? Time for you to part. I have ensured you are aware of the teaching of the Koran, so we can now bring this meeting to a close. This is a joke. I understood from your letter that there were other documents to be released. Uh, sensitive matters, it says here. I do not care what it says there. I have no more to say to you. Madam, I have made a not inexpensive journey from Paris for a specific purpose. I have hotel and other expenses. I should have wasted a week for an hour in your company talking tosh. 
This is an outrage. I demand a recompense for my trouble and monetary outrage. Recompense? You demand recompense, Monsieur Pizarre. Yes, but it is rather a lot of money to lay out for such frivolous chat, madam. Very well, you shall be recompensed. Come. As I said in my letter, my husband left other material which I think may interest you, only this time you must pay the full price. Pardon, madam, if I inadvertently said anything. Enough, monsieur. You have made your choice. You demanded recompense, and recompense you shall have. We must go down the spiral staircase to the room below. His secret library. Secret library? Yes. I closed it down after my husband's death. Nobody has entered it since. Be careful, Monsieur. There is a cabinet of his work down here. It was not widely known that he also devoted himself to experiments in the coarser fields of literature. You mean that? You know what I mean. But I do not wish to discuss it further with you. You may see it with your own eyes. <laughs> This is an amazing room. Truly palatial. The chandeliers above must have cost a fortune. They did. The walls are... I don't believe it. They're covered in red leather. Oh, you're right not to believe it. Appearances can be deceptive. It is, in fact, skins that cover the wall. Thousands of tiny dyed skins. Another of my husband's little quirks. Hmm. To what family of creatures do the skins belong, madam? Pick up any of the volumes on any of the shelves and see if you can guess. They also are covered in the self-same skin. But they're rotting where they stand on the shelves. That is the trouble with rat skin. It doesn't last, does it? Rats, I cannot abide the creatures. Good. Anyway, these books are not the work of my husband, so of no interest to me. Let them rot. But you said there was other material down here. There is. Over there. In that large steel cabinet in the corner. You may open it. No, can I? The gap between the cabinet and the wall it faces is too small. The door is too wide. Well, first you must go into the gap. Now you simply open both doors in front of you. But I'll be trapped in here if I do that. Oh, come, Monsieur Pizarre. What do you fear? The books are going to jump out and bite you? I'm sorry. The rat skin on the volume I have made my mind crawl. I can't stand rats and the feet. Of its dead skin. Monsieur Pizarre, I assure you there is no dead skin inside the cabinet. Now either swing the doors open and see what's on offer, or let us forget the matter and return to the salon above. No, you're right. Books don't jump out, and as you promise, there's no dead skin in here. <laughs> Books don't jump out, but of course rats do, particularly if they've been trapped without food for 24 hours. Still, I spoke true. No dead skin. The skin that covers them is very much alive. You saw everything, Doctor? I did indeed, madam. And? As I predicted, I think the man's disposition is such that, unable to physically escape, he will shortly escape by fainting. Ah, oh, his timing is impeccable. Get him below, shall we? Yes, time to be putting him to the final test. You have the meat, Cleaver? It's already in place. Good. Recompense? You shall have recompense enough, Albano Pizarro. Save your strength, my friend. We have much to do. The tide in the vault below will soon be on the turn. Open the hatch. We'll get him down. Hold his arm while I place the manacle on his wrist. The chain and its shackle at the bottom of the pillar are strong enough? So the blacksmith tells me, yes. Ah, good. The tide is turning. The flood will soon begin. Perfect. How long before he comes round? Where am I? Where have you taken me? You are in the vaults beneath the Palazzo Tortini. The tide has turned and is in the process of flooding in. But at your feet, you do now have a weapon with which to defend yourself. Cleaver? Against the tide? No. Against the rats that the tide drives in. No, See? No more rats, please. You know, I can't stand them. Not I a pretty sight, are they? Evil red eyes all a glint in the dark. Bodies coated with sewer slime. And in their hundreds, they will come, Monsieur Pizarre. <laughs> oh, I was so pleased to discover you don't like them. Please! They will hold back at the water's edge for as long as they can because of your human presence. But finally, they will have no choice but to move forward or drown. So, they will move forward. As you can no doubt see, the construction of these vaults will drive the rats past the pillar to which you are chained. They will be attracted by the fresh blood on your face and will surely attack you if they sense fear. So do be brave, Monsieur Pizarre. Be brave. <laughs> <laughs> 
Remarkably bold, too, these sewer rats, yeah. and sensible. Mm. They go for the eyes and the throat, as you discovered upstairs. Yeah. But you may defend yourself with the cleaver, yeah. and you have a first-rate chance of surviving their attack. Come, Dr. Mazanaris. Time to go back to the salon. My guests are expected shortly. I was forgetting. Is it the money if I returned it? Too late. What's that? The rats are beginning to move forward, monsieur. But you have a choice. You're being generous. You gave Madame no choice, but simply went ahead and ruined her life. I'm sorry. My career was at an end if I didn't get money. I'm sorry. Much too late for sorrow. Much, much too late. So, you could be eaten by the rats. But with the cleaver, we have guarded against that. You have ample defense in your hands. Though, of course, if you escape the rats, another problem faces you. Another? The rats will finally congregate on that high ledge to escape the rising tide. You, I'm afraid, cannot join them there, for the chain will prevent you reaching the steps. So you could drown. Unless... Unless? You have a choice. What? What choice? <laughs> What choice do I have? <laughs> remember the Koran, Monsieur Pizarre. Simply remember the Koran. And think of the prescribed punishment for the thief. And if you think the punishment is just in your case, you can be both judge, jury, and he who executes the sentence. That is what the nice, sharp meat cleaver is really for. What is the sentence? Think about it. It will come to you. As the water laps your mouth and you contemplate death by drowning, I'm sure it will come to you. Madame Freitas and Dr. Mazanares greeted the guests that evening with no outward show of any knowledge as to the drama being played out below. Water, as I said, is inexorable, and tides will have their way. It was a night to be remembered. People poured into the palazzo as rats in ever greater numbers poured into the vaults below, smelt blood, attacked, and were killed in their hundreds. But water also poured and finally rose to drowning death. I won't do it. I won't do it, you What other choice is there? What other choice? They were right. There is no other way. <laughs> it was over a year before Albano Pizarre returned to his Paris office. Paler and thinner than he was before. Everyone noticed how much better he treated his authors thereafter, but with women clients he had no dealings. And he never ever spoke of how he came to have had his left hand hacked off at the wrist. The cast in that chilling tale of revenge was Madame Freitas, Sarah Bedell, Albano Pizarre, Roger Hammond, Dr. Mazanares, Ian Lindsay, and the secretary, Emma Gregory. Invitation to the Vaults was adapted for radio by Wally K. Daly from a short story by Basil Copper. The director was Martin Jenkins. I am Edward de Souza, the man in black. And I shall be here at the same time next week with a cautionary tale in which fear drives a man literally to the edge.